So here the learner connect. So what do you do? Um, so basically, the uh, rate of backports, especially for ARCH64, um, every time we add a change to the GCC toolchain, we have to make sure we don't break anything. And so I've been doing a lot of work on automating the entire uh, testing and backport validation process so that we can kind of not have to do it manually because it's just way too much. When you start building 35 different configurations of the toll chain, you want to make sure that nothing's broken. And so the whole goal of this is to have higher quality toll chains and not have strange bugs sneak in because nobody caught it. Um, test results are pretty huge and stuff, so it's a lot of work to, to actually validate every single backport. But it's finally all working now reasonably well kind of cleaning up the output formats at this point. So basically we get email if we've actually broken anything with our patch, which is kind of nice. And it's a fully automated. So where do you start working at the Lenaro? Um, actually, my first project for Lenaro was their three-week-old organization. I was actually at the very first Connect, which is um, held coexistent with a uh, Ubuntu Developers Summit a bunch of years ago and stuff. Um, I officially joined Lenaro um, about 18 months ago. But uh, in the beginning, what, what, what were you doing? Toolchain work. <laughs> I've uh, been a um, freelance toolchain GCC consultant for 20 some years. And you kind of uh, were involved in the beginning of everything, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been working on GCC since the late 80s and stuff. Um, one of the projects I wrote is called Deja GNU, which is a regression testing framework for the uh, GNU toolchain. And I wrote all the original um, test suites for the BIN utils, GCC, GDB, and all that kind of stuff. And that's kind of why Lenaro dragged me back into uh, cleanup validation and testing and stuff, because we sort of needed it. Um, a lot of that infrastructure is kind of old and a little bit rotted. <laughs> And uh, as a hobby also, you, you climb mountains, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to Yosemite tomorrow for 10 days. <laughs> and uh, last year, what did we do? Oh, last year I went to Nepal for five weeks after Connect. And so uh, to the top of the tallest mountains, right? Well, Everest, what do you do? nobody so got Wi-Fi to... on uh, Mount Everest, or what do you do? Actually, there's Wi-Fi about two and a half hour hike from Mount Everest, funny enough, in a nearby town. But um, yeah, I was basically working in Everest Base Camp last year, fixing solar charging systems and reprogramming radios. I'm also a radio technician and renewable energy engineer, so I spent a lot of time doing that and climbed a bunch of five and 6,000 meter peaks while I was there. And so around here, all these guys, uh, what do you do here with them? Do you like discuss about things? What do they all do? Well, there's a lot of different people here, not just the people that I work with on my own toolchain team, but um, a lot of our member companies and a lot of other people using, you know, ARM and AR64 processors and stuff. So it's kind of good to, um, you know, get new ideas from people and bounce ideas off people and just kind of keep things fresh. Some of the inner working between other teams is kind of interesting too. So, uh, how did the uh, free software start? Um, free software started because of Richard Stallman. Um, and basically, um, he wanted control of his uh, software life, so to speak. Um, a lot of us got into it because back in the mid-80s and stuff, it cost around nine or $10,000 for a compiler per engineer. And a lot of small startups at that time couldn't really afford the compilers. And so a lot of us started working on GCC so that we would have a compiler that we could actually afford to use since it was free. Well, free in cash, but not free in time commitment to make it all work correctly. And now they call it open source, right? Yeah, yeah, salespeople didn't really like the term free. They said it's really hard to sell stuff with the word free in it. Um, Michael Tiemann invented the word sourceware back in the mid-90s, but it never really caught on, although sourceware.org is kind of the main um, you know, tool thing. But yes, uh, some other friends of mine, like Russ Nelson and stuff at the OSI, came up with the term open source, which seemed more business friendly. And that's kind of taken over the industry as far as uh, verbiage goes. And so uh, the ARM open source, uh, the ARM uh, free software uh, ecosystem is the most interesting to work in or what? Well, it's, I mean, it's just another processor for me, but it's also getting a lot of design ins these days. It's the ARMs in most of our phones. It's getting to be in a lot of network routers. A lot of the current generation ARM chips are very, very nice. Um, I mean, they've finally gone from really old and slow and small low power to pretty high power and also st you know, high performance and low power and stuff, and so it's kind of now moving into the server market to reduce, you know, electrical consumption and data centers and things like that. So it's kind of fun working on new technology that's changing very rapidly and getting better and better all the time. It's, it's very disruptive, right? 
Yeah, but disruption is fun in the industry. Otherwise, we stagnate. <laughs>